money, consciousness, and human values. I think it's really central that we understand that we look at money in the context of the whole society and we look at it, it as one of the institutions intended to promote human welfare and well being sustainably in the society. And therefore, we have to see not just money, but how all our institutions are operating. About now 10 months ago, uh, we were approached, the Academy was approached by this group in New York, which has become, which is now called the Future Capital Initiative. Uh, and uh, as I think most of you know, and I believe we circulated the draft report of the group uh, uh, before the conference, before this meeting, uh, on a on a report that was on consciousness and capital. And frankly, when uh, Mila Popovich, which many, who many of you know, uh, called me and said, we have an opportunity to be at the United Nations in New York as a, the invitation of the Office of Partnerships to talk about consciousness and capital. I said, Mila, this sounds a little unusual. <laughs> if you had said, that this was Boulder, Colorado or something, or Berkeley, I might have understood, <laughs> but that sounds a little far out. Uh, and uh, we were invited in and became official partners of the UN, uh, but the, the driving force for this were a group of people, some of you have met Lawrence Ford, and a very interesting group of people uh, who are working on impact investing and uh, how to change the way the financial system works. And it's interesting because uh, uh, three, uh, Thomas and, uh, or, no, I'm sorry, Frank and Mila and I became members of the design group for this group. And we attended calls for about four or five months before the conference. Initial conference took place on September 12th and 13th at, in the UN as preparation for a major summit at the UN next September, uh, all in partnership with the UN. And it was interesting that through four months of, night, of weekly calls uh, where the word consciousness was being passed around, not once did anybody say, well, what is consciousness or what are we really talking about? Now, obviously, every one of them thought they knew, and I was, I was, and when somebody asked Lawrence uh, 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 about that, he said, "Oh well, we know exactly what we're talking about, but we never talked about it." <laughs> that was interesting. So the the subject has come up again this uh, the, today, and not that I'm particular about defining consciousness in any particular way, but I think in some sense we do know what we're talking about without being very mystical about it. At least I'll tell you what comes to my mind when we use the word uh, without necessarily getting into uh, mysticism, spirituality, or uh, uh, or any of those things I value a lot, or the sciences, but the arts and, uh, and other professions and other perspectives suggest the fact that we realize that reality is an integral whole, and we can't get at the essence of it or the totality of it unless we're able to have a consciousness that embraces them all. So this is a mental perspective of, of consciousness, which I think is part of uh, the issue. Another issue that came up this morning, uh, and it comes up whenever we talk about communism and capitalism, but it comes up in, in democracy or anything, is the relationship between the individual and the collective. Because we have societies that culturally have been much more emphasizing the sanctity of the collective. And we have, in recent centuries anyway, societies that have much more been emphasizing the sanctity of the and sacredness of the individual. I think if you look historically, or anthropologically, uh, and I'm not an anthropologist, uh, but uh, I think we could say that the evolution of human society has been more and more from the complete, the dominance of the collective to more and more respecting 
and encouraging the development of individuality. And I don't mean to pose those as alternatives uh, or contradictions to each other, but it's natural if you want to start a society, the first thing you have to do is ensure loyalty, uh, so, uh, mutuality, because otherwise you don't have a society. You have a bunch of people working for themselves and the moment the enemy comes, they run away to protect themselves. That there's an inherent necessity for a society to be viable that it first of all ensures that it preserves itself and then it can develop the individual. So it doesn't mean one is more important than the other, but there is a certain logical primacy in what you have to emphasize. And if we look at the history over thousands of years or doesn't matter centuries, we can see, especially in the last 500 years, more and more of an emphasis of the collective itself, develop, recognizing the importance of the development of its individual members and not just of its central authority. And we've done it through freedom and democracy. We've done it through education. We've done it through human rights. We've done it to the point where we say it's not just the strong and, uh, and those who can contribute the most, it's the weakest, it's the minority, it's, the, it's those who need personal support and help. It's important. And if you look without prejudice, I hope, on which of the societies are the most vibrant, they're societies that recognize the truths in both elements, the truth of the collective and the truth of the, uh, in the value of the individual and the, the necessity of finding the right, I don't even want to say balance, but complementarity between the two. I think that the rationale for the direction of evolution has been the more we can value the human being, and develop the capacities of each human being, the more vibrant, productive, sustainable the collective is. Provided that when we mean that, we mean we're really developing the individual and not just what we could better call in psychology individualism. And that is every person for himself, which is kind of the law of the jungle for survival of the fittest. And if you read, as I have in studying psychology, uh, all of the great humanistic psychologists, when you really ask them about what is their conception of the individual, it's not the guy who can, who can dominate over everybody. It's somebody who, whether you call it self-actualization or self-realization or by any other term, it's somebody who knows that they are identified with the collective, and yet the best way they can serve the collective is by developing their own capacities in a way that is harmonious with others. And that's humanistic psychology at its best. It's not a, it's not a mystical uh, tradition, and I think it matches reality. And we, we are more individualized. Our societies are more individualized today. And yet it doesn't mean but we are more reflecting on how do we relate to everybody else. We're no longer trying to divide everybody by religion or ethnic group or gender. We're realizing that there is a commonality and we're all in this together. So I think that's some part of the issue of consciousness as well, to be able to reconcile what appear to be contradictions or opposites, or we either choose one or the other, but see how they're complements to each other. And that capacity to see complements where uh, 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 earlier we saw contradictions is part of what we mean. The third dimension of it was what came up of itself this morning and which we're gonna talk about uh, uh, much more and Lynn is gonna talk about it, but it's come up from all, in all our discussions is the question of values. At values itself, is a, a, a kind of obscure word because it means very many things depending on who we're talking to and whether we're talking about economic or ethical or moral or whatever it is. But I think there is a universality of this word. The way I think of it is that values are the quintessence of wisdom about what works for sustainable human welfare and well-being. 
and all, not just because it's good. The religions teach us this is good if you don't have those values, you may get in trouble with up there. Uh, you've got to do this or you're sinning or something like that. But apart from all of that, I think if you look at the values, uh, freedom, equality, fraternity, whatever they are, honesty, integrity, trust, trustworthiness, and it's a very long list, uh, 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 respect for other diversity, respect for other beliefs, respect for other traditions, respect for uh, other cultures and everything. This makes essence of good sense if you want to have a sustainable society. Uh, it's pragmatic. We don't have, and as a business consultant, I go into companies and have been doing it for 40 years, talking about you want to, you want to maximize your performance? Raise your values. I don't, you want to maximize your performance? Raise the values with whom, which you deal with your customers, you, you deal with your employees, you deal with the community and with, the integrity with which you deal with suppliers and everybody else. And I, in my study of corporations, I found that's the best formula and that's behind the, the success of companies that <coughs> go for a long period of time. So I'm trying to give this a, a more pragmatic uh, uh, basis. It doesn't mean everybody follows it but I think there's a truth behind it. So, we are now talking, this session is about uh, money, consciousness, and human values. We're really here to talk about is money. And we started this morning talking about values and social power uh, and <coughs> consciousness with regard to money. So the question is, what does it tell us about money and what is the consciousness or values with which we're using this fantastic social invention. And let's take the simple <coughs> example of language on the one hand or internet on the other. We know that language can be used for abuse, it can be used uh, to raise people for warfare and aggression, uh, it can be used for the opposite of harmony and constructive collaboration, and we know the internet, or the blockchain, or the Bitcoin, uh, or the financial markets can be also. Any of these systems is neutral. It depends on the consciousness or the values with which we use it. And so what, my, just my last point is, uh, what does our economic theory today tell us about the relationship between values and money and financial systems. I think very little. And that's a product of the fact that, let alone the fact that as somebody mentioned, Adam Smith wrote the, uh, 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 on moral sentiments before he wrote the, uh, the Wealth of Nations, I think because our economic thinking and our economic institutions are largely a product of this effort to secularize knowledge and to treat our knowledge of society the same way we treat our knowledge of physics and botany and, uh, and uh, anatomy. Uh, and in the social sciences, I don't think we can afford that divorce. We can't afford to treat uh, the subjects of social science as if we're treating some inanimate object or some uh, biological species. And my last line is that uh, uh, um, Karl Popper, the philosopher of science, warned against beware of this uh, effort uh, to apply extreme naturalism in the social sciences. This is not a natural science. This is a human science. This is about human beings and human relations, it's not about the laws of nature, it's about <clears throat> the laws we create to create the welfare and well-being of everyone. Don't we need an economic science that pronounces on the values it's seeking to realize and evaluates policies and institutions not according to this is the way they work. They work the way they do because we allow them to work the way they do, but the way they should work in order to maximize the benefits to humanity.